I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders and signs, and you're still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are scars in your hands. That your goodness is good without end And you'll never change I will tell of your wonders Sing of your grace The God of creation Knows me by name The Lord is faithful Yesterday, now and always Always Your mercy is mighty after age, all generations will bow down in praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. I believe you will come in the clouds. I believe you are here even now. In your presence, I know there is power, power to save. your wonders sing of your grace the god of creation knows me by name the lord is faithful yesterday now and always always your mercy is mighty age after age all generations will bow down in praise the lord is faithful yesterday grace the god of creation knows me by name the lord is faithful yesterday now and always always your mercy is mighty age after age all generations will bow down in praise the lord is faithful yesterday now and always Always tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation he knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now and always. Always your mercy is mighty, age after age, all generations will bow down in praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Um, I didn't put a slide up, but we are in search of um, nursery workers. We, we want to have um, a staff nursery every Sunday for um, parents of, of little ones. So if that, if that would be something you'd be interested in and you feel capable of doing, please let us know. To be in the nursery, you just have, need to be a member of the church, and you need to be able to pass a Corey background check. But we'd love to um, have a nursery worker for every uh, Sunday to serve um, the, uh, the little ones that, that we're ac accumulating uh, here in our church. The other announcement is about our um, church business meeting that's coming up. Um, it's going to be on June. We'll continue to announce it. But this is going to be our budget meeting. That's going to be the main item we're going to look at together and vote on. 
uh, all the members of the church will receive a, a draft of the budget a few weeks ahead of time so you can look through it and ask any questions before the meeting um, that, that might come up. If you're not a member of the church, you're actually welcome to come to the, um, our members' meetings um, as well, especially if you're just interested to know what's, uh, what, what's going on behind the scenes in the life of, of our church. Um, with that being said, we're going to turn our uh, hearts now to God's Word. Um, Psalm 149. We're almost through the Psalms. I don't know if you've been tracking, but we've just kind of been going through Scripture, finding calls to worship. Um, Psalm 149. This is a call to all creation to praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of his faithful people. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Every Sunday is an invitation God is giving you to come into his house. I mean, when's the last time someone invited you over to their house? You know what that feels like? It's always a special thing that someone thought of you. God thinks of you every week when he calls us to worship on Sunday. So let us delight to bring him praise and anticipate um, what he'll say to us um, today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you so much for our church family that we get to see each other again and be refreshed by uh, the grace you've given us through Christ. We offer ourselves to you today, Lord, just to do with, with, with us what you will. Um, we we, we want to hear uh, you speak. We want to hear your direction for our life. We want to know um, our position before you and, and be um, um, assured again of our place um, hidden in Christ. So we offer our praises to you, Lord, and we, and we pray that you would work them in us to make us more like Christ today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Yeah, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that even the creation groans uh, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. And there's this whole idea of expectation just kind of built into creation itself. One of my favorite lines from this song that we're going to do is uh, an offering of worship to the Lord is this. Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing but this joy is mine. You've been given the ability to do something that the only the, uh, the all of nature is just waiting to do. It's just uh, holding back because God is waiting for us, his sons and daughters, to let loose uh, the worship that only he deserves. Whose glory taught the stars to shine. Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing. But this joy is mine. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs, a thousand more. Who else would die for our redemption? Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs, a thousand
the Lord to the Lamb to the King of heaven praise for he rose now he reigns we will sing for truly a humbling thought to think that um, however much uh, praise and worship we were able to uh, muster up here in this place, however much we were able to offer to you, Lord, um, it would always fall short of what you're worth and what you deserve. You deserve truly all of the worship and all of the praise, and we recognize we live in a world uh, that falls short of it, and we know that because we know we fall short. So, Father, we would just want to commit ourselves to you in a fresh way here uh, this morning and ask that you would uh, meet us here, inhabit the praises of your people, and be pleased uh, by this gathering of your sons and daughters, Lord. Um, Lord, we know that you are not far away from us. Um, although we may hear voices all around us questioning your presence and questioning your faithfulness and questioning just your presence with us. We, we worship Emmanuel, the God who is with us. And there is no place that we can run and flee from your spirit. And those of us that know you as sons and daughters, we'd never want to. Thank you that those who seek you will, will find you. And we seek you with all of our hearts. Oh, how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide? And oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you graced the other side. And oh, how long have I chased rivers from lowly seas to where they rise against the rush of grace descending? 
from the source of its supply. It's in the highlands and the heartache, neither more or less inclined. I would search and stop at nothing. You're just not that hard to find. So I will praise you on the mountain. I will praise you when the mountains in my way. You're the summit where my feet are. So I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands and the heartache all the same Know how far beneath your glory Does your kindness extend the path from where your feet rest on the sunrise to where you sweep the sinners past know how fast would you come running if just to shadow me through the night trace my steps through all my failure and walk me out the other side could dare ascend that mountain, that valleyed hill called Calvary. But for the one I call Good Shepherd, who like a lamb was slain for me. So I will praise you on the mountain, and I will praise you when the mountain's in my way. You're the summit where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands and the heartache all the same You're the summit where my feet are 
I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands and the heartache all the same. Please uh, join me in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you and praise you this morning because uh, we know that it was Jesus and only Jesus who was worthy uh, to walk up that hill and to lay down his life for us. Father, we have all fallen short, as your word has tell, told us, and as we're reminded, all we like sheep have gone astray. And so we thank you and praise you this morning for the good shepherd the one who has laid down his life for us. And thank you that in this world, as broken as it may be, and as backward as it may be, that we can still be people of hope, people of joy, people of purpose. Because each day that we're given is a new opportunity to demonstrate your faithfulness and your goodness and your grace and your forgiveness and your mercy. Father, this morning we want to pray for the, the physical, biological family and the church family of uh, Tim Keller as he is now with you in glory, as he has finished his race. Father, for those of us that have been deeply touched by his life, by his preaching, by his teaching, by his books, um, by his apologetics, Lord, we want to thank you and praise you for one such as this. Thank you for his life and for his legacy. Thank you for sending such a one to a place like New York City to love the people there and serve them and pastor them so well for so many decades. We pray, Lord, for uh, all of those that were part of his, a direct part of his ministry in the churches. And Lord, that uh, you would continue to raise up new people because of his testimony that would uh, continue to carry the torch into dark places and uh, continue to remember that. Your gospel is powerful and it is good. And no matter how far we may think we have fallen, your gospel message has the power to transform and change us. So, Father, thank you for, um, for faithful witnesses. We thank you for the faithful witnesses that are here, that, uh, Lord, recognize that this gathering is just an opportunity to encourage one another and build one another up to, to go out into this world and to, uh, Lord, speak to an upside-down world about it a God who has come to bring this world right side up. Lord, to shine our light into darkness, knowing that it's not a light that emanates from us, Lord. It's the, your reflected light off of us into those places that we go. Thank you for the mission field that you've given each one of us in our families, with our relatives, in our places of work, in our neighborhoods. Father, we thank you for the opportunities that you've given us and that we, we see every single day to let people know that there is a hope and that there is life beyond the grave and that eternity is real. Lord, we ask your continued hand of blessing and provision on this church. Thank you for the, the membership that is here. Thank you for the message and the, the ministry that goes forth from here week after week and has for over a century and a half. Lord, we just pray for the churches across Cape Cod and New England, Lord, that you would strengthen them, that you would sweep this region of the country with revival, Lord, that you would wake up the sleeping giant that is your church, and Lord, that you would um, breathe a fresh wind into your sons and daughters that are here. Lord, we thank you for those that give of themselves uh, each and every day, those firefighters and police officers, ambulance drivers and EMTs, those in the military, Lord, those that serve us in our community, we ask your protection over them, we ask your provision for them. We ask you to continue to raise up uh, good men and women of honor uh, to serve in those positions um, that do jobs that most of us would not want to do on a day-in and day-out basis, Lord. We, we thank you for them and their servant's heart. May you bless them and draw them to yourself and continue to point people. Pray for chaplains to go into those places and, and to continually point them to, to the hope that is Jesus. We thank you for our community. We thank you for this community right here. Pray these things all.
In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Scripture reading this morning comes from Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 18. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in according to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain, but even If I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Thanks, Bruce. If you have a Bible, turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2 because we're going to be continuing to look through uh, this passage together. On Thursday, I found out through some x-rays that my pelvis is a little crooked. And it's actually caused my lower spine uh, to be warped. Now, thankfully, this is not a medical emergency. And a simple lift in my right shoe should set everything right. Uh, in a few weeks. The underlying problem is actually that my right leg is 14 millimeters shorter than my left leg. And it's forced my lower back into quite an uncomfortable position for years. Our passage this morning, if you if you heard, is actually pretty dense. Um, and yet it is straightforward. The first half is, is this theological um, um, poem, essentially, about the nature and character of Jesus. And the second half is practical instruction on how we are called to respond in light of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And yet, just when we think it's, it's simple and straightforward, and, and it shouldn't really be that difficult, the Apostle Paul mentions the context in which all of this is taking place in verse 15. He says, the purpose is so that you would become blameless and pure children of God without fault. Here's the context. In a warped and crooked generation. The world of Paul's day, as much as ours today, is warped and crooked. Meaning, there's actually a good design and purpose that it has. Which would bring success and flourishing if things were level. But that good design and purpose has been bent and twisted and skewed in all sorts of different directions. Putting everyone and all of society in quite an uncomfortable situation. This is the fallen condition of God's creation under the curse and corruption of sin. And we read of it in Genesis 1, chapter 1 to chapter 3. God created the world with good design and purpose. Adam, who was created by God to be a federal representative of all future mankind, rebelled against God's good design and as a result of his sin, brought onto all humanity and creation this cursed, warped condition that we experience every day. Now, in the letter to Philippians, Paul has warned the church against living in line with this warped and crooked generation. And what does that look like? He, as he writes, well, we try to take advantage of of other people for our own self-interests. 
And when things don't go our way, we are stuck in a loop of grumbling and arguing. To quote a movie I've never seen, it's a dog-eat-dog world. Everybody's out for what they can get. If that's the way life is, what do we do about it? How should we respond? Well, there are a couple solutions that people come up with. Here's one solution. Work harder, or sorry, work smarter, not harder. Learn better techniques uh, for taking advantage of other people. Discover how to out-strategize everyone who's out to get you and get them first. That's one idea. Here's another idea that people take. They say, no, don't, don't, don't try to do that. That'll just exhaust you. It's not worth the trouble. Instead, just hold yourself back from close relationships with people and learn to become self-sufficient. When it comes to your self-interest, become your own supplier. But there's a third way. The Apostle Paul writes about it here in verse 5. He says to put on the mindset of Jesus Christ. Another way you could translate it is have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. And what was that? Well, we saw in our in the previous verses to the section last week, verses 3 and 4, he says, in humility, here's the, here's the third option. In humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but actually to the interests of other people. So you don't need to learn uh, better techniques of how to get your way over other people, and neither do you need to protect yourself from close relationships and learn to be self-sufficient. Why? Because God himself has entered our warped and crooked world to make it right. He did this by pouring himself out for us. And because Christ poured himself out for us, for our advantage, we can be set free to pour ourselves out for others, even at our disadvantage. It's the main point of our passage this morning. Christ poured himself out for us. Therefore, we can be set free to pour ourselves out for others. So let's unpack this main point by just walking through our passage a little bit more. What is the mindset Christ had when redeeming us? And how does that then set us free to serve one another? Well, there are three dimensions to Christ's humility that is explained in this passage. Starting in verse 6, Christ was in the very nature of God. Being in very nature of God, he didn't count um, equality with God, something to be used for his own advantage. Jesus Christ has been truly God from before the foundation of the world. In the world of the New Testament, people believe that, that man could become God. I mean, that's basically the underlying theme of, of all Greek mythology. Mankind can achieve godhood. What sounded ridiculous to them as they're hearing these apostles preach was that God would ever become man. They knew Jesus of Nazareth was a true man. There was no doubt about that. The scandal of Jesus was not that he was a man who had the potential to become a god, but that he had already been God and chose to become man. This is what the church has confessed for millennia in our creeds. God is one essence in three persons. Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, shares the single divine essence with the Father and the Spirit. So the very glory of God that is worshipped eternally is Christ's glory. The very power of God which created the world is Christ's power. The very majesty of God that is worshipped on heaven's throne is Jesus Christ's majesty. And yet, rather than using his divine nature for his eternal advantage, Jesus set it aside for a time to redeem this warped and crooked world. How did he do it? Next, verse 7. He made himself nothing. Other translations will say he emptied himself. By taking the very nature of a servant, same word for slave, being made in human likeness. Now, some through church history have thought 
and still today have thought that Christ gave up certain divine attributes like a compassionate genie might um, surrender his magical powers to become a human being. Jesus did not give up any part of his divine nature. He simply added a human nature. And of course, that wasn't a simple thing, but he added a human nature. He didn't give up a divine nature. He added a human nature. He's still one person, but now he's eternally existing with two natures, true God, true man. We don't need to bounce around from passage to passage or theory to theory to try to figure this out. Actually, the text right here tells us what we need to know about this. What does it actually say here in this passage? He did not empty himself of certain divine attributes he had. He actually emptied himself. He himself was the object of the emptying, his whole self. He had a divine nature, yet he did not use it to his own advantage. Like a father might play basketball with one hand behind his back to make himself equal to his child. The father has two hands. It's simply he's withholding from himself something that he has in order to identify with someone else. Remember back to the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. Satan tempted him to take advantage of his divine attributes. But Jesus refused because his path to the cross required him to endure our fallen human condition in every way except sin. So Jesus emptied himself by withholding divine advantages and experiencing a true human nature. Have you ever thought, why in the world did it have to be this way? Seems kind of complicated, God, your route of redemption. Why did God choose the incarnation, the humility, the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Christ to redeem his creation? Seems to be a little overkill. Why did it have to be this way? Because Christ did not come just to be any ordinary human being. Christ came to be a second Adam. Now, this is not a theme of this passage. We can read of the the first Adam and the second Adam theme in Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15. But I believe that this concept helps us catch up with what Paul is writing about here in Philippians chapter 2. So, for example, listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead must come through a man. For just as all in Adam die, so all in Christ die will be made alive. In order for God to redeem man, God sent a second Adam to obey rather than rebel. And so that this second Adam could be rewarded by God rather than cursed. And as a result, so that all those who are born of this second Adam could then inherit the reward of the second Adam rather than the curse of the first. Unlike Adam in the garden who was limited in his power and glory and sought to grab onto God's own power and glory as his own, Jesus Christ already had the power and glory of God. It was already his. He did not need to earn it or compete for it. And yet, in perfect contrast to the first Adam, who attempted to grab something that was not his for his own benefit, Christ willingly surrendered something that was already his for the benefit of others. Now. We are not left to be sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. In Christ, we can be called children of God. The next verse answers the question, to what extent? How far did Christ have to go as a human being to redeem us? Verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, if you've been with us in the sermon series, you know uh, where Paul is while he's writing this letter. He's in prison, and he's facing the possibility of execution. Now, since he is living under the Roman Empire in the first century, we might be thinking, oh, if he's sentenced to execution, he's going to be crucified on a cross. But that that was actually probably not going to happen. That probably would have never happened to Paul. You know why? Because he was a Roman citizen. And, and, and even the Romans acknowledged that crucifixion was such a shameful way to be killed 
they would only they were only willing to do that to foreigners and slaves. So it shouldn't go unnoticed then. In verse seven. That it doesn't say that Christ took on a human nature, although he did. It's more specific than that. He took on the very nature of a slave. Even though Christ was clothed in splendor and majesty as true God overall, he willingly stooped down and put on the humility of a creature that he had made and pursued this all the way to a slave's death. Why? What possibly could be the point of such extremes? What message is being communicated in this? Well, for one thing, it makes clear to the watching world and to you and to me this morning that in stooping down to redeem us, Jesus held nothing back. There was no part of himself that he withheld from you. He poured himself out. What a magnificent redemption. Has anyone ever stooped down from such heights so low to help you, to raise you to such glory? Christ saved us in this way to pay our sin debt in full, to lift our curse completely, and to grant us the reward of his own resurrection from the dead so that we might dwell with God together in glory. This is the solution Christ offers us in the gospel. And while we wait for our redemption to come in full, we learn from the second half of our passage that God has actually saved us for something here and now. He hasn't only saved us from the penalty of sin, but also its power. And now that you've been saved from the power of sin, you can actually grow into Christ's likeness even in a crooked and warped world. Look back at what Paul says in verse 12. He says, as you have always obeyed, and then he goes on, continue to, and we're expecting him to say, obey. As you have always obeyed, continue to obey. But that's not what he says. He says, as you have always obeyed, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Like a a musician, uh, not a musician, a magician. Like a magician who pulls out a continuously colorful um, ribbon from his sleeve, we are called to actually pull out Um, This new life that God has put in us in Christ, to use more theological language, since we have been justified in Christ, we ought to pull out a sanctified life. Grow up into the salvation that you've been given in Christ right now with fear and trembling. Kind of an awkward phrase, but it's not that complicated. One New Testament scholar uh, writes this. Paul does not imply cowering in terror, but to simply have the due awe and reverence of taking seriously the responsibilities of Christian obedience and Christian citizenship. Fear and trembling are the appropriate disposition precisely because God is the one who is at work within you. When it comes to our new life in Christ, we need to obediently trust God to work out the salvation that he's begun in us. And all this time, Paul has been describing what it looks like. Put on the mindset of Christ. Working out our salvation means to work toward looking more like Jesus, who humbled himself in obedient trust to God by pouring himself out for us. How then should the humility of Christ reshape us? How should it reshape our lives living among this warped and crooked generation? Two ways. First, It shows us that we don't need to learn better techniques for getting people to serve us. God is in charge. He has appointed Christ as judge. Now, some here might be looking for behavior modification tips, and you really could take or leave Jesus. You just want to know how to live better. You actually need to stop trying to fix your life and come in true faith and repentance to God. Look closely at where Paul goes next. He doesn't end by talking about Christ's death and then move on to address us and say, and then you guys should live like that. He goes on in verse 9. He says, therefore, God exalted Christ to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is one Lord over creation. It's not you. It's not me. We have not been given the right or authority to manipulate our environment or the people around us for our own self-interests. Jesus is Lord of creation, meaning that you and everyone around you exist for his glory. And this risen Lord has stooped down in grace to save you from the sin of Adam, to redeem you from the curse that comes uh, when man attempts to be God. And this verse tells us that all will bow. There will be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But on that final day, many will be doing so as a defeated foe. As for today, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of grace. Today, this proclamation is given as an invitation to bow before the risen Lord with reverence and awe and to receive as your own the redemption of his grace with fear and trembling. And when we humble ourselves under God's reign rather than our own, we will be set free to pour our lives out for others rather than argue. Like two siblings bickering in the room, we need God to come into the room, break it up, and remind us that neither you nor you are in charge. We need God to reestablish our arguing underneath his rule and reign. The church in Philippi may have been struggling with this. As Paul writes in chapter 4, he says, I, and he names people, I plead with Eudea and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Even churches can get warped and crooked when we attempt to assert our own authority onto other people. When God has set Christ as head over the church, and we see his expressed will in Scripture, we realize, oh, we're not even in charge of this. And we find there's actually so much less to argue about when we close our mouths and let God speak. But we need to be changed from the inside out. Willpower will only get us so far. So consider Christ. Consider Christ, who did not argue on his way to the cross. He wasn't arguing with the Spirit. He wasn't arguing with the Father. He didn't say, why should I have to put up with this? He said, not my will, but yours be done. He did not seek to take advantage of what was rightfully his, but he was always in perfect agreement with the Father and the Spirit. Arguing enslaves us to pursue our own self-interest But the gospel reshapes us with a humble freedom to pour our lives out for one another. Because God exalted Christ over all creation, we don't need to learn better techniques for arguing. God is in charge. Therefore, we can humble ourselves under his reign and be set free to pour our lives out for one another. Here's the second way the humility of Christ reshapes us. It shows us that we don't need to hold ourselves back from close relationships and learn to become self-sufficient either. Now, when we see the example of Christ, we might think, oh, I could never live like that. I could never imagine treating people the way Jesus did. Because if I pour myself out for others and I give and give, I I might never get anything back. I might get burned. But the gospel actually tells us that's okay. You don't need to seek your own advantages because someone else already has. Someone else has got you covered. God cares for us the way he cared for his own son. Romans chapter 8, a couple verses there says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us. Because in Christ, God is for us. And Paul goes on, and if God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. How will he not then also, along with Christ, give us all things? And what are these things? Paul writes about it in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. 
We've been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. When you believed, you were marked with him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit that is guaranteeing our heavenly inheritance until our final redemption. God raises us up with Christ and seats us with him in the heavenly realms in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. The gospel reshapes us. It reminds us that when Christ poured himself out for us, he was vindicated by God and raised in glory. And when we are hidden in Christ, God adopts us as his children and cares for us all the same. So we don't need to preserve our self-interest because God will lavish on us eternally a heavenly inheritance on the final day. That's how when we humble ourselves underneath God's care, we are set free to pour ourselves out for others rather than grumble. We grumble when things don't go our way. We grumble when we don't get what we think we deserve. We grumble when we see other people receiving things that we desired for ourselves. Yes, we live in a warped and crooked world that seeks to take advantage over each other, but we don't need to protect our self-interest because Christ poured himself out for our eternal advantage, and that can never be taken away. So consider Christ. Consider Christ who didn't grumble on his way to the cross. When he was illegally tried in court, when witnesses stood up to give false testimony about him, and when he was abused and mistreated by his accusers, he opened not his mouth, but entrusted himself to the Father who judges judges justly. So we likewise, as the Apostle Peter writes, ought to humble ourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The Apostle Paul applies this to his own life at the end of our passage in verses 17 and 18. He says, even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul's referring to being poured out for the, for the church in martyrdom. Yet he says, even if, Rejoice. Why? Because Christ poured himself out for us and God exalted him. And if God didn't spare his own son but gave him up for us all, for, for us all how will he not also give us all things? Grumbling enslaves us to guard our own self interest, but the gospel reshapes us with a humble freedom to pour our lives out for other people. Because Christ poured himself out for our advantage, we can be set free to pour ourselves out, even at our disadvantage, for others. And when this good news uh, grips our hearts, we will be set free. We will shine, as Paul writes at the end of verse 15, as bright stars in a dark sky. Verses 15 and 16. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. When a warped and crooked generation is so preoccupied with grumbling and arguing its way to its own self-interest, it becomes radiantly obvious when a single person humbly lays down their advantage for the interest of others. And as stars shining in this dark world, we can point others to the one who made us radiant, to the one that God raised in glory after he poured himself out for our redemption. So before we close, reflect for a moment on these questions. Are you too distracted from serving others because you are pursuing your own self-interests? Are you too distracted to pour yourself out? Do you find arguing and grumbling a natural response instead of humble contentment? What is, what is natural for you? Grumbling and arguing or humble contentment? If so, God is inviting you to receive a gospel-driven humility. 
So consider the humility of Christ and let it reshape your life. Let's pray now. Let's pray and give ourselves to God. Reflect for a moment on something he's, he's um, prompted you to give to him. Father, we praise you so much for, uh, again, this beautiful day you've given us, these beautiful people you've, you've brought us together with to worship you. <clears throat> and we thank you for your beautiful son who has lived a, a perfectly obedient life and died a sacrificial death to reconcile us to you. Not just to reconcile us to you, but to give us ears to hear your word so that while we walk this life and wait for our redemption, we can know you're calling on our life, and we can be helped along. You can work out in us the salvation you've begun. So give us strength and give us hope to grow like Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. I just want. Speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Amen. Well, don't rush out of here. Make sure you say hi to someone and catch up. We're going to go out with God's blessing today. This comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.